Hello, this is Thomas Keegan with LibertarianProgressive.com, um, where we're doing 2012 candidates interviews with uh, independent and third party candidates. Um, they're going to be on the ballot this year. A uh, lot more interesting than, you, you know, watching uh, Republicans and Democrats 99.9% .9 of the time. So take a look. If you've already seen some of these, you know what we're doing. But uh, if, if not, we're here to. Um, uh, give you some more of your options, and um, and uh, we I uh, think that this is a year where it's um, uh, very important, where people are uh, informed, and then um, send a, uh, a shot heard around the world. In other words, um, 50 plus uh, elected officials to the Congress, um, and and all over that are uh, it's uh, not Republicans or Democrats, independents or um, uh, third party candidates to the. Uh, federal government in the in the congress and um so one representing each state as a metaphor today we have on the line uh, somebody uh that we haven't talked to yet um pat timmons uh he is uh in uh, michigan in the um fourth district um he's running against uh a Republican and a Democrat, um, uh, of course. Um, I mean, that's all we've ever known, and, and, and so I guess you could always guess that it's going to be a Republican and a Democrat. Um, but that's not something that has to always be forever. Um, that's just the way things are now. And uh, and so Deborah um, Worth is one of his competitors, and uh, David Camp. Uh, David actually is incumbent, who had, did vote for the reauthorization for national defense authorization act where they allow indefinite detention um uh you know uh, stalin style basically just pluck you know just uh taking people without them even knowing what what where where they went or, or why and and etc um but i uh, so i'm sure you, you want to hear from uh pat here and um so pat we usually ask people what motivates them um and uh what got them to uh you, you know, do something a little bit different this year um, uh, by, um, you know, getting signatures or however you get on the ballot and getting on the ballots and putting yourself out there as a uh, candidate um, that uh, it's going to champion issues, that people have a choice, um, that uh, it's a little bit outside the box besides the uh, Republicans and the Democrats. Um, and, uh, and people can um, visit Pat's uh, website here. Um, let's see. Um, Actually, I just had it up. I'll, I'll, well, I'll say that um, in, in, in just a second here. But, Pat, good to talk to you, and thank you for taking the time today. And how are you today, and, and what got you um, motivated to uh, be in this uh, campaign 2012, sir? Well, Tom, thanks for your call today. I appreciate it. Uh, thanks for the chance to connect with voters in Michigan's 4th District. My website is www.pattimmonsforcongress.com. And I have a Facebook page and trying to connect with people through the web. Um, I'm 62 years old, a uh, retired small businessman and a retired educator. And uh, I've voted for Republicans and Democrats my whole life. And it's dawned on me the last three or four years that growing unease that we're passing down our problems. We're not solving any of our problems. We're simply passing them down. We're making them worse. Uh, we're kicking them down the road to uh, our children and even more importantly in, in regards to our debt to our grandchildren. So I decided to uh, do something different and run for office. It's the first time I've ever run and uh, I'm running as a Green Party member because I believe in their platform and their values. The three issues that I'm focusing on, uh, the first is uh, a form of grassroots democracy. We have to reform our government. In 1970, there were 165 lobbyists in Washington. Uh, in 2010, most people don't realize it, but there were over 35,000 lobbyists. And it's clear that this has become a fourth arm of the government, and it's clear that they're thwarting the will of the people and preventing uh, the solutions to many of our problems. Yeah, and this arm isn't... Um democratically elected and this arm um, doesn't care about democracy and um, this arm um, y y y you know is uh, kind of dictatorial and, and fascistic um, I mean we have a separation of church and state 
And that's to protect churches, right? Um, and and isn't it the exact same principle, though, um, with separation of corporation and, and states? Or what do you think? Maybe I'm wrong on that. But well, I, I, you know, I think we have separation of church and state uh, to protect uh, every citizen's right to worship as they choose. Uh, there's no sponsored uh, religion in America. That's right. And that's... That's one yeah, of the reasons. Because if there was one, country. yeah, if there was one, then all the others wouldn't have their equal rights, probably. You know, so. Well, and, and our forefathers, uh, many of them were victims of religious persecution, and we certainly don't want to reinstitute that here in America. And, and really, what that is, I mean, if we just look at the definition of it, I mean, it wasn't. It, it was they, they were under per persecution of a uh, of a big organization that. Um, had unwieldy power and that wasn't a democracy and, and that basically was dictatorial. Um, it just so happened to be a called a religion in those days, but um, I mean, c couldn't the case be made for some corporations kind of being like that, especially the ones that deal with arms and, um, and sabotage and things like that? Well, I'd have to think about that a little okay. bit before I draw that conclusion, but certainly I'm, I'm concerned about the fourth arm of the government. They're not in the Constitution. Uh, but it's clear that uh, their voice is louder and heard more readily in Washington, <coughs> excuse me, than ours is. Uh, it's clear that uh, the legislature, the Senate, and the House both respond to lobbyists far more quickly than they do to everyday citizens. Yeah. So I think reforming our government is, is a big part of, uh, of why I'm running. Uh, I fully support the move to amend. Uh, that's a movement to uh, roll back the Citizens United decision uh, passed in the Supreme Court. Move to amend simply uh, states that uh, corporations are not people and that money is not free speech. They're not equal. They're not equivalent. And so we need to make sure that the people, uh, the people's will is expressed in our government. Right now that, uh, that's not happening. Yeah, corporations aren't people, um, and, and, and they have different legal statuses, and they can live forever. They don't get the death penalty. I, I mean, they're, they're not, not people. Um, you know, you can't shake its hand. I guess there are people that can be in a corporation. I guess that's what, you know, some, like Romney might try to argue, that, like, yeah, it's people. I guess that's what he meant by it. But, um, but, um, but it's not just one person then. Or I guess, you know, I guess it could be. But the thing about what I was, and it's just food for thought. I'm not asking you to, to you know, give me an answer right now, Pat. I'm just saying that um, it's the same thing that uh, the separation of church and state, I think, actually protects um, most religions um, because it doesn't allow one to boss the others around. That it, It's the same thing with the corporations. It'd actually be beneficial for most corporations not to have their money going to their own competitors. Um, and uh, and, and, you know, most of them would be better off, um, you know, with the separation. That actually is how Mussolini defined fascism is a combination of corporation and state. Um, but I, I hear what you're saying. I, I mean, definitely we need to take our government back. It, it, I mean, everything it seems like, um, you know, they, they, they're doing stuff that the majority of the people want. We always see it in the polls. The people want this and um, and they don't do it um, and they do something else that's just the opposite it's as if it's as if they're trying to you know just um, I don't know it's as if um, well I guess they do try to be sneaky about it but they always claim excuses there's excuses after excuses like um, there's always things added on to bills um, you know, we're, they're pressured to do that. Their party made them do that. I, I mean, um, it, it's what, what do you think um, electing somebody? Now, there's two parts of this. One is you're an individual. Um, I mean, you're just Pat Timmons, um, you, you know, uh, apart from the Green Party or anything else. You're just Pat Timmons. But the, the second thing is, I mean, what, it, what kind of message would it send also electing an individual like yourself? Um, who seem to take these, um, uh, you know, your oath of to the Constitution seriously? You care about the debts, um, which, by the way, you have an excellent video on that on your website, um, and that's Pat P A T and then another T T I M M O N S F O R Congress dot com. Um, what, what do you think? Um, what kind of message would that send to um, to the powers that be if if we elected uh, somebody uh, from the Green Party for Miss, uh, Michigan's District Four? I think it would be very exciting. Um, 
you know, it'd be exciting for me personally, but I think it'd be exciting for the country. Um, you know, the incumbent in this uh, election has over $3 million, and almost all of that money is from PACs and super PACs and corporations and individual donors, uh, high-value individual donors. Uh, all but 3% of that money is from outs outside of Michigan. And obviously those people want something for their investment. Uh, I'm not saying that they're buying his vote, but they're certainly buying uh, his attention. They, they, they certainly, uh, the incumbent is, you know, knows what their issues are and knows they're what not, they, what they're they not want. They're not giving that they to you. I mean, they're not giving that money to you for some reason. Uh, no, they're not giving that money to me. That's for sure. That's for sure. And I think money, you know, is, is the root of that, that, that uh, that's how corporate interests get their voice heard. Um, a, a good example on my website, just a, a, a very minor one, but I think it's a telling one, is uh, the bottle bill. Uh, Michigan has a great bottle bill law. Uh, we have the highest uh, redemption rate on uh, pop and uh, beer bottles and everything that's covered, uh, we redeem 97% of those. So Michigan's a much cleaner state. We recycle much more. It's a terrific thing. That bill was passed in 1978, and there's plenty of evidence that it's a great model bill. Uh, but it's never been passed on a national level. It's never even been passed in another state. And that's because corporations like Anheuser-Busch and Pepsi-Cola don't want that. Now, they can't come out against recycling. You know, that would be a pretty foolish public relations policy. So the way they get their will is they say, oh, we're not against, uh, we're not against bottle bills, but we support curbside recycling. And the advantage of curbside recycling for them, even though it's far less effective for the state, the advantage for them is that they lay off their costs costs about uh, under two cents a six-pack to recycle it through a bottle bill like Michigan has. And so they save two cents a six-pack by having it picked up at the curb in the red uh, red plastic bin in my house. And um, that saves them the money, and they you know claim they're for recycling, but they're really for passing off their costs on the local government. Well, I, eventually, eventually someone, you, you know, with their paid um, the pundits and, and, and their strategy team, they'll probably eventually find a, a way to say, like, oh, recycling is actually bad for the environment. So I'm sure they'll eventually come up with that. And people will probably buy it, you know, um, or some people will. I'm just, I, I'm just kidding about that. But, um, but you know, it, 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 I think it's very possible that could happen. Um, so reforming our governments, um, and, and that goes to what you're just saying. I mean, that can cover a lot of different issues. Um, repaying our debts um, and restoring our environment. Those are the three big ones. Like you're kind of, um, you know, you have some big three big issues. And uh, and I guess a lot of things could branch off of those as well. But um, Well, they're, symptom they're symptomatic of all the things that aren't happening. You know, if you look at our debt, uh, the video highlights the fact that it's been growing for about 60 years. Uh, like a small cancer inside of our, our country. Uh, there have been plenty of chances, uh, particularly in the 60s and 70s, to address it and to get back down to a balanced budget and to some kind of fiscal sanity, but they didn't do it then. And uh, as the debt grew in the 80s and 90s, uh, it became a little bit harder, and it was going to be unpleasant. Um, in 1990, the debt was about four trillion dollars, and so you're talking about real money. Yeah, you did it uh, every ten years. I saw in the video, and, and people should watch that. It's a really good video. I mean, even if it's not even just a campaign video, it's a really good video, and 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 um, it's it's right there, and it's uh, it, it's like you went by decade. Like in 1960, it was this amount, 70 or, or 1980, 1990, and it it expe exponentially grew it, it, every single decade. It like doubled um, from what the previous uh, decade was, pretty much. It, it was almost uh, a doubling uh, every 10 years after 1990. And so we're, we're in a lot of trouble now. It's a severe burden on our grandchildren. Uh, and that's, you know, really is the issue that drove me to distraction. And that's with uh, a, like, 1% interest rate. I mean, what if the interest rate went to 3%? 
Uh, we couldn't even calculate how fast it'd be growing then. I mean, it would, you know, you're right. There's uh, tremendous cheap money out there. I mean, we have a lower credit rating now, so maybe interest rates will eventually go up, you know? Um, well, it's, it's, it's hard for me to predict that. I don't know enough about that. I just know that interest rates are low now, and we're very fortunate that, uh, you know, shortage of capital is not Can our problem. Get America. out of this, Des. I hate, I hate the fact that our country is in this debt like this, and it is bogging down. I mean, it's not just this invisible thing that's out there. Um, it actually is does affect us um, and our economy because because we are all kind of symbiont in, in symbiont relationships. So, so if your neighbors are doing bad, it's 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 going to affect you um, most likely. I mean, it, it does in some ways, um, even if it has to do with crime and other things. Um, so uh, and just the general psychology of the nation, um, and that affects the economy as well. Um, so how do we get out? How do we get out of this? Uh, debts. I, I want to get out of this debt, Pat. And 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 what? I, and then the Republicans and the Democrats—they're getting us into more debt. So I mean, you're the only one who's talking about really getting us out of debt. How do we uh, uh, get out of it? I mean, even, there's only there's only two ways to get out of debt. There's two two big tools, and uh, one is you spend less, and the other is you increase your revenue. And my position is you've got to do both. Uh, the debt's so enormous, uh, you can't just do one. For instance, the Republicans would say, oh, we're just going to cut spending, and that's going to get us out of debt. Uh, we're, not, we're never going to increase taxes, and Republicans might even still argue that uh, lowering taxes is, uh, is part of their deficit reduction package. But you can't do that. You've got to do both. Um, all, the, all the sensible bipartisan panels, Simpson Bowles, being the most recent one, okay. uh, Pete Peterson's done a lot of good work on debt. All the answers are out there already. We already know what the answers are. We just don't have the political will. Now you would go with that Simpson Bowles. I mean, basically, it seemed pretty. Re it, it's on the path on the right direction. Um, I mean, it, it, I you know, and of course, two years from now, we might even find even better ways that we could adjust that Simpson Bowles. But at least that. We, you know, we could stop kicking the uh, ball down the road and, and just start doing, um, so, and, and I don't think it's really going to hurt, uh, you know, it's not like an austerity type of thing so much, really, you know? Well, I think it would be uh, pretty austere compared to what we're doing because it would mean that we'd have to stop spending, I think, in three big areas. Uh, the first is, I think, that uh, personal entitlements, uh, for instance, I'm 62, I get Social Security payments. We're going to have to at least uh, uh, slow those down, freeze them, something like that. Well, they corporate said, entitlement. the Simpson Bowl said, um, I'm sorry to interrupt, Pat, they, they yeah. said it's going to pretty much raise a year, and like, uh, and they're going to raise the age a year within like 20 years. I mean, that seems pretty reasonable, I guess, you know? Mm-hmm. Well, we need to do something. Uh, for personal entitlements like Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, we're going to have to slow down the spending there. Another area that doesn't get talked about much is corporate entitlements. Uh, right now, uh, the latest figure I've read is that uh, between tax loopholes, subsidies, uh, outright gifts, uh, we spend $1.2 trillion a year in corporate entitlements. And that's a huge uh, piece of the federal budget that's either not collected through, you know, tax breaks or something like that, or uh, is given in outright subsidies. Uh, and so that needs to come down. And then the third area that I think we need to reduce spending is our military. Um, we have the most powerful military force on, on the earth, and I'm very proud of our soldiers, sailors, Marines, and airmen. Uh, I'm proud of the work they do, um, but we simply can't afford to be the policemen for the world and send our young men and our young women all over the world uh, enforcing whatever we think uh, is the right path for other countries. So we need to um, bring that uh, institution down to scale. Yeah, the military-industrial complex, I mean, I guess there's a difference between defense and, and uh, military spending, and, and I think the troops, I mean, I'll say this, I mean, I mean, even though there's been some bad examples in the media, but overall, I think um, even better than um, our State Departments um, and Hillary Clinton and everyone, I think our troops are actually our best ambassadors from most of the stories I've heard. Um, 
And uh, so, yeah, thank goodness we, we have them and, uh, you, you know, and, and they're not bought and paid for, but they are working side by side to, and, you know, military contractors are basically, you know, mercenaries. Um, and, and sure, there could be some places for some mercenaries around the world, but they're getting paid like 10 times as much. So, I mean, talking about corporate welfare, there's a lot of it in the military. And how can we ever, um, you know, pretend to be free um, and, and be able to defend ourselves if we can't even stand up to special interests? Well, y yes, um, we need to we need to identify um, what's the purpose of our military. And um, you know, all too often, I think one of the uh, comments that I make in my constitution, my my campaign video about the constitution, is that. Uh, the founders of this country uh, made it hard to go to war. They wanted Congress to approve all wars. And the purpose of that was so that it was hard to go to war. Unfortunately, in modern times, that power has been pretty much given to the executive branch, and it's far easier to go to war. And I think it's time to take that power back into the House of Representatives and uh, make it harder to go to war so that we don't resort to military solutions where diplomacy and, uh, and other things can work. Uh, so I strongly feel that, you know, we found it far too easy to go to war. The most uh, glaring example, of course, is Iraq. That was a, uh, a fabrication. Um, I think that it's going to be, historically, it's going to be looked at as a colossal mistake for America. Uh, we've invested a lot of uh, a lot of toil, a lot of blood uh, in a totally inappropriate war, and um, I think historians are not going to be kind to the uh, folks who were part and parcel of that. Yeah, it, it's um, not something. Um, <laughs> well, George Washington would have done. I mean, he actually um, a, a, warned us about uh, also not just Dwight David Eisenhower, who spoke about the. Uh, military-industrial complex um, on his presidential farewell speech, which you can look at. It's kind of become more popular as of late. It's a, it's a very eloquent uh, testament to the predicament we're in now. Yeah. It, I, would, I would urge everybody to go back and, uh, and, and find uh, President Eisenhower's speech. Uh, of course, he was General Eisenhower before he was President Eisenhower, and he was very concerned about the military-industrial complex, and I think many of his fears have been realized. Yeah, I mean, why else would he say it on his farewell speech? And George Washington's farewell speech also, in two places, warned about a standing army. Um, so two generals that were presidents on their farewell speeches gave warnings um, that, um, you know, uh, we don't always heed. And uh, so th th that also, um, I mean, do you feel, do you get the sense that, um, you know, we need to roll back some laws as of the last decade that have uh, violated our civil liberties, the Bill of Rights, actually? Um, I think those things need to be looked at, absolutely. Absolutely. And I noticed that time is running down. I also want to talk about the environment. I think this is uh, the great unspoken issue of uh, the, the campaign. Um, you know, the Republicans and Democrats have just finished their national convention. Nobody's talking about peak oil. Nobody's talking about uh, climate change. Uh, this past summer, the weather we had this past summer uh, has kind of stunned the uh, scientific community because, of course, uh, high temperatures and drought is occurring far earlier than the models predicted. Uh, and so, you know, everybody was saying, oh, those scientists, you know, they're, uh, they're scaredy cats, they're raising the flag, and don't worry, we've got lots of time. And in fact, uh, the drought across this country is going to cost us a lot this year, uh, and we need to start husbanding our natural resources instead of uh, expanding them and polluting them. Yeah, I like the way you said that. I mean, it's it's definitely we should be husbanding our natural resources. I think um, I think a lot of people 
are um, concerned about the environment. Um, and then a good subject here real quickly. Um, I mean, you know, there is like a, a, a plastic heap in the Pacific Ocean the size of, I think, like Texas or something uh, because all the waste and it's particulated there and, and amassed there. And then there's lots of different, and I mean, you know, you could go from nuclear to genetically modified um, organisms spreading their seeds into the natural environment instead of being closed off like um, the genetically modified salmon. At least that doesn't spread across the sea. Um, and, and if they did, the salmon would be too big, so they wouldn't be able to jump over the things to make their, you, you know, full cycle trip. But um, and, and so there, there's a lot of, you, you know, effects that affect our environment. I think the thing is a lot of people, and here's a debate you might run into, is, is um, you know, they're against the cap and trade, which, it, like, so I don't think that's, um, it, you, you know, the, the solutions, but there are solutions. I mean, definitely going more to solar, being more independent off of uh, oil, um, perhaps, um, you, you know, ethanol from, from hemp, um, and, uh, and, and so many other things. Wind, solar, there could be a whole next generation of solar panels um, that, that can transform twice as much energy. Uh, so uh, I hear you on that. Um, now, Pat, there's just two more questions I have. Well, what, the last one would be is if I forgot anything and you wanted to bring it up. But um, we always ask people, like, uh, what their favorites, um, or it doesn't have to be favorite, but just some uh, figures in history or that are living nowadays that um, uh, you find interesting and, uh, and why, sir. Okay. Um, I guess if, if I were to look at figures in history, uh, uh, I guess the part of American history that I know the most about is World War II. My dad was in World War II, and so I've studied that a little bit. And I think that um, Mr. Churchill, uh, Prime Minister Churchill, and uh, Governor Eisen, Governor, excuse me, uh, General Eisenhower, would be two figures that I would uh, look to. Churchill, because he realized the importance of optimism. Uh, we need optimism badly in America right now. When I'm out campaigning, people are discouraged. They hear I'm running for Congress, and they give me a look like, you know, uh, what kind of drugs are you on if you think you're going to change Congress or you think we've got any chance to fix what's going on in Washington. Uh, well, just, so let me ask people, that what kind of drugs are they on to think that that wouldn't be the solution to do it? Well, you know, I'm I'm trying to I'm trying to do that to say, you know, we can make a difference for our grandchildren. Um, it's it's important. So optimism is important. Churchill knew that. Churchill led the British people out of an incredible fix, and uh, led the country out of an incredible fix, and used optimism as a uh, as a great tool. Uh, General Eisenhower's uh, strength, I think, was uh, listening to his subordinates and getting the best thoughts from a group of people, and we need to do that in Washington. Uh, the liberals, progressives have good ideas, the conservatives have good ideas. We need to start implementing the good ideas no matter where they are on the spectrum and uh, start addressing some of our problems. Um, I think uh, the bottle bill, just to go back to that briefly, is a good example of uh, using the capitalist, capitalist system, a 10-cent deposit, uh, brings great results. We align the uh, incentives correctly, and we get great results in recycling. Uh, and so we need to use conservative solutions, we need to use liberal solutions, uh, and get this country going again. Okay. That's, what I'm, that's what I'm standing up for. I mean, and I think it would also help, Pat, um, if, you know, if, if you do have some other um, fellow uh, people that are also elected that are independent and third parties, imagine um, you know, getting there as a freshman in Congress and, and seeing out of the 535 that you're not alone, that there's other Green Party, possibly libertarian candidates and independents um, who are, you, you know, we're, they're going to sincerely work on things in the best interest of the people, at least have a honest conversation about things. Um, and uh, so, um, I mean, w w you know, that, that would be so. so you, well, that, would, that would be pretty exciting for the country, without a doubt. Uh, if we broke the monopoly of the Republicans and Democrats, because uh, both the Republicans and Democrats are listening to the lobbyists. I mean, they, the amount of money uh, that lobbyists put into Washington is incredible, and the reason for it is they get a lot out of it. Uh, they get control of the agenda. They get uh, laws that are tailored in fashions to their interests. And um, 
you know, we need we need solutions that are going to work for the citizens of this country. Well, you're definitely um, for uh, getting a reforming the government, paying down our debts, um, and, and you said you know we need to pull back a lot. Um, uh, you know, military spending in, in in Iraq was a mistake. So I think we we see where um, you, 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 you know how 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 you uh, your, your thought process there, and I do appreciate you being thoughtful on, on things, sir. Um, and and uh, so that's another thing. I mean, you you would um, take the time to understand the bills that you would sign if you would, you know, vote yay or nay on them. You wouldn't just say yay, nay, just you know, at a whim. Um, of course, like it seems like the republic some of the Republicans and Democrats do, and even though they don't, they're signing stuff they don't understand. Um, but um, do, was there any final uh, uh, thoughts that you had, sir? And, and wrapping up here, and um, uh, that you, you know, I might have forgotten, or that you know, um, that you'd like to share. Well, I, I just encourage people to uh, to to look at the record of the Republicans and Democrats. And the conclusion I came to is that uh, we need to look somewhere else for our solutions. That those two parties have uh, have lost their way. Uh, I found mine in the Green Party. I think there's lots of other independent small parties out there. Um, I, I know there's lots of citizens with goodwill in this country, and we simply need to band together and, uh, and head in the right direction. And I, I, the country is anxious for that. Uh, and I hope that uh, people will take a look at my website and you know, get involved. Isn't there a term, I mean, for when people just, des when, when they just wake up or decide to do something different when, you know, they've like, like Pavlov's rats been zapped by choosing two different things and then they just decide, they, they get like an enlightenment or a light bulb in their head or something goes off. I mean, is, is there, do you know a term for that or is? Uh, well, I, 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 I reject the Pavlov's dogs analogy, but I think enlightenment is a, is a good enough term. I mean, I, I really thought uh, in 2011 that uh, the super committee was going to at least make a, a beginning on our debt problem. I was stunned when uh, 12, Dem 12, excuse me, six Republicans and six Democrats, uh, some of the leaders of the Senate and the House got together and decided they couldn't even make progress on the, on the, on the debt in that small a group. And, and then they compounded the problem by signing off on a deal that uh, allowed the debt to raise another two trillion um, until after this election. So I think that you know enlightenment is a, is a good term. Voters need to step forward and select citizens who are going to go to Washington and uh, work on these problems. And here's a like kind of just a. A question that just popped in my head right now um, about caucusing. I mean, are, are you going to try to refuse to caucus with either party, or, or how do you think that will work out? Or do you not? Um, I, I I don't have a, an answer to that, Tom. I'm, I'm not that that far along. Okay. No, that's that's fair enough. Um, and it just yep. it's a lot of this is just food for thought too. Um, and so, uh, and that that's a. You know that can be a good thing too to um, uh, be thoughtful on, on on your answers. But but if you do want to see where he does stand um, for sure on on, on certain issues, it's uh, Pat Timmons for Congress dot com. And um, Pat, it's been a pleasure. I'll say goodbye to you after this interview. If you hang on for just a second, and I hope you have an excellent weekend, sir, and uh, uh, much success in your uh, campaign here for November six, two thousand and twelve. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, sir. Thank <laughs> you.